Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Scott. How are you doing today? I'm very well. How about you? I'm, you I'm doing okay here on the west coast of Canada. Um, and I see that we've got a bunch of people joining us. That's great. I will give them a minute to be moved from the waiting room to the webinar. This is the second time that you and I have met with people for a meetup on feedback informed treatment and deliberate practice. The first one actually was, a, I thought it was pretty fun. And you know, <laughs> we, had a, we had a full house like we did, like we do this time and we're planning on doing some more. Uh, yeah. Just really grateful to the FIT community for joining in and uh, hanging out with us for the next hour. Uh, I also want to thank the people who have uh, sent questions in advance. That allows Cynthia and I to prepare some slides with some information to answer the questions more completely than just off the cuff. For those of you who have not met my colleague before, perhaps you haven't been at one of the intensive trainings in Chicago, let me just take a moment and introduce uh, Cynthia Mayshock, who, as you heard, is in BC, Canada, and is the Community Relations Manager, manager Longtime Manager of the International Center for Clinical Excellence. So thanks, Cynthia, again for being here. You're welcome. I, I can turn my video on momentarily and wave. Okay. All right. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> for those of you who are online, I, we're going to address the questions uh, in some semblance of order in terms of topics, starting with the uh, topic of feedback-informed work and then moving on to deliberate practice. I'll name the person who asked the question. But Cynthia will be monitoring and participating uh, throughout. And if you have a, an additional question or you want some clarification, and you're somewhat familiar with the Zoom, then please just use the question and answer feature. Cynthia will note the questions and either interrupt me in the flow or add at some point when we uh, take a breath. Sound good, Cynthia? Yeah, it sounds good. So the Q&A um, feature is if you hover down and you'll see a dashboard. So if you would just type your question in there and then uh, We'll uh, try to address them uh, if this is time as we go along. Um, I think we should just go for it. Perfect. So again, welcome to this uh, informal meetup and chat about feedback-informed uh, treatment and deliberate practice. Uh, the first version of this I'm going to be releasing as a recording tomorrow on my blog. So look for that email uh, in your inbox that says that it's uh, been released. It's an hour long. Please share it with your colleagues. We really got through some great questions. We got some additional questions today. And the first one is from a colleague in Sweden. Elizabeth R's question again from Sweden. She says, I am really interested in in DP exercises doable for uh, online supervision. And this is like all of the questions that we've got this particular time, a, a really pertinent question and an important one. How do you do deliberate practice? And let me just say that our new book will be out uh, in on May 26, it's called Better Results. You can pre-order that right now on Amazon.com. And in there, we lay out a case not only for deliberate practice, but for how deliberate practice is different from what all of us think of when we practice that we simply repeat things over and over again uh, in an attempt to master particular skills or techniques. So I promise you that in the next year, there are going to be dozens of books come out about deliberate practice. It's an interesting development that started with the publication of our 2007 article on super shrinks. And in that article, we talked about and introduced the work of K. Anders Ericsson to the field of psychotherapy. Prior to that article, the, the term deliberate practice had never, ever been used in any psychotherapy writing. We talked about practicing and rehearsal. Uh, and successive refinement, but we had never talked about deliberate practice. And so my sense about what's going to happen, and I've already seen some of the writing that's being done, is that deliberate practice will simply be applied to the way we think about therapy in a traditional way. Meaning, 
since we value treatment models in our field, you're going to see lots of books that are how to do deliberate practice if you're doing CBT or IPT or ACT. And in order to understand the difference here about deliberate practice and Kay Anders Erickson's pioneering insights about it, you have to think very differently about the process. It's not just about mastering a particular skill. Rather, deliberate practice is really about finding out where your individual growth edge is, where your particular outcomes fall short, and then identifying that growth edge and figuring out which factors have leverage on outcome to help you push your performance a little bit further. So for that reason, deliberate practice, from my point of view, it really can't be applied to the mass learning of skills. Instead, we have to figure out how is, where does this individual practitioner fall short, which makes supervision a perfect opportunity. One of the results that we reviewed last time was that supervision, the supervision literature really doesn't show that supervision makes much difference in terms of outcomes delivered to clients. How you might wonder why? Well, it's because most supervision traditionally has been about a, mastering a particular model, so your supervisor shows you when you did the technique right or didn't do it right, or B, providing uh, some kind of therapy for the therapist. It was a place to go and unload your concerns about the client and get some kind of support. For supervision to work in a deliberate practice format, you're going to have to then start with feedback-informed work. In other words, you're going to have to get the clinician to measure. Otherwise, you're not going to know what to do. So as Daryl Chow would say if he were here, you have to focus on the what before you focus on the how. And everybody wants to know how do we do deliberate practice. Instead, you've got to figure out what do I as a supervisor need to help this individual therapist with. And that means, as I said, you're gonna to have to get them to measure their performance. Most of you have already started doing that using the ORS and the SRS. You establish a clear baseline performance level, and then you begin to parse that data, the aggregated data, once you have sufficient data for it to be reliable, and begin looking for wh where and with whom your outcomes may fall short. So perhaps you sort your cases by diagnosis, or by gender identity, or by time of day, or by whether you see people individually or in a group. And by doing so, you can look at your effect sizes and see, are there shortcomings in that particular area? And in that respect, then you can begin to try to figure out how to help that individual practice. So let's say you find out that perhaps their outcomes fall short when working with clients who are depressed. The next thing you have to do is look for which factors in the therapist's performance have leverage on outcome. So in terms of identifying the what, whatever you're going to teach the therapist has to be specific to their growth edge, but it also has to be predictive of outcome and engagement. It also has to be influenceable. Does no good to practice something in a particular area that doesn't have much influence on the outcome. Additionally, it has to be ongoing and recurrent. Everybody has a case with a client that might be depressed that doesn't go well. What we're looking for is recurring patterns of shortcomings in the individual therapist's performance. And of course, it has to be measurable. So it has to have these particular qualities for us to identify what to practice. So here's what we've done so far. You have measured your outcomes. You've begun to parse the data and look for where those outcomes fall short. You've looked, you've identified an area that's specific to your growth edge and you're now trying to identify what's predictive of outcome, influenceable, ongoing, measurable, et cetera. That's where we go back to the so-called therapeutic factors. And we're gonna to begin to organize our practice efforts in one of these five different areas. Your shortcoming may have to do with a failure to structure, to explain, or to have a ritual that's engaging to that particular client or it may be in the area of hope, expectancy, and allegiance. Perhaps you just don't foster belief in the process and expectation of results with a particular client group. 
perhaps with certain kinds of clients, you're not as reflective or responsive. Or it could be that with a particular group or type of client that you lack the ability to convey understanding and empathy. You do a little less collaborative work from the client's point of view. And finally, that shortcoming could fall in the area of not utilizing or responding to client resources. So this is where you would begin to look for the, the uh, particular problems a therapist has, the shortcomings they have, map those shortcomings into one of these areas. Once you do that, you can then target your exercises in supervision to help the client improve in that particular area. Why these areas? Well, if you look at the percentages within the parentheses, these are things that have leverage on outcome. So Elizabeth, I hope I gave you some idea. I know it's probably not the answer you were looking for. I think we might be looking for simple exercises that people can do in general, but really in order for an individual therapist to deliberately practice, it has to be targeted to their growth edge. How are we doing, Cynthia? Um, we're doing good. Elizabeth uh, did have a comment uh, about okay. what you were just talking about, and she, um, that is the, I believe this is a question, is the areas in the taxonomy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And then there's two other questions. Um, let, me, let, me, let me just show the taxonomy for people who haven't seen it yet. Here's okay. a picture of it. And this was developed uh, several years ago by Daryl Chow and myself. And it, it's, you can get it when you download the package of measures from my website. So just go to my website, scottdmiller.com, click on Fit Measures Licensing. If you haven't done that for a while, go back and re-download the measures. We're always adding languages anyway. And then inside you'll see the TDPA, the Taxonomy of Deliberate Practice. And this particular uh, workbook, so to speak, helps you, once you identify a weakness in your clinical performance, it helps you catalog that performance automatically in the areas that have leverage on outcome. It then helps you winnow it to a single objective that you can work on. And this is where Elizabeth's role as a supervisor becomes super critical. Once you have worked with that supervisee and you've really narrowed it down to an item, then your skill as a supervisor will be in helping create exercises that work that weakness muscle, so to speak, and make it stronger. Go ahead, Cynthia. Okay, so Steve is asking, I'd love to hear your thoughts about using deliberate practice to address emotional and personal issues of the therapist, such as personal bias, anxiety, performance needs, etc. And so uh, let's go back to uh, these, these items here. You may find at time that certain therapist factors are either facilitating or getting in the way of outcomes. And if you look at the third item under therapist factors, it's self-regulation. So one of the things you may find is that you experience certain kinds of feelings with particular clients. Here are some that I've had. I've ha felt angry and frustrated, and I've also felt bored by clients. This, if it bled into the clinical work consistently and with particular types of clients or client issues, might be an issue of self-regulation. If you map that onto the taxonomy in the area of therapist factors, you could then narrow it down to a single focus that you could then deliberately practice. So that does fall within factors that can have uh, a positive or a deleterious effect on outcome. Was there more, Cynthia? Yep, um, there is uh, one more question, or two more actually, um, from Tommy, I believe I'm, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but anyway, uh, says, I'm an academic teaching clinical practice in FSU's College of Social Work. Any thoughts about teaching in a classroom, um, brackets now online, uh, fit particularly to students? So, yeah. So I'm really grateful for this question. Uh, and it's, it's actually related to the question that Tori Knight asked. Uh, so let me repeat her question. I'll try to put the two together. Here's what Tori said. You've cited research on fit that reveals a significant period of time between learning fit and being able to use it effectively in a clinical setting. Uh, 
I'm wondering what strategies might uh, reduce that period of the learning curve so that we can use FIT more effectively sooner. And so let me just show you what uh, Tori is talking about. And we did mention this in the last uh, webinar that we did. Initially, when the results started to come in about using routine outcome measures like the ORS and SRS to inform clinical practice. The studies reported fairly large effect sizes, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and they also implied, uh, sometimes didn't imply, sometimes explicitly stated that FIT could be taught in an eight-hour workshop. I was always skeptical of both claims. First, that simply administering measures would have an effect like a 0.5 or a 0.6, deeply skeptical of that. And secondly, that it could be learned so quickly. I thought that that showed our ignorance of everything that led up to the creation of the measures. For me, what led up to that? I started with a particular model. I found out that my outcomes didn't change. We explored an alternative way of thinking and working. That didn't work. Then we began to measure our results and we started noticing that some therapists were more effective than others. That led to deliberate practice. All of this knowledge comes to bear when people like myself or Cynthia are using the measures with a client. So it does take time and the research actually showed that these claims in the beginning when we first started doing ROM that you could learn it in an eight hour period were simply wrong. And the seminal study in this area is by Norwegian psychologist Heidi Bratlund. She did find that clients of therapists, think about this, clients of therapists when they were using the measures were two and a half times more likely to experience improvement than when the same therapists were not using the measures. Amazing. That finding has uh, been heralded all over the place. The second piece of her research, however, was not so proudly announced, and that was there was virtually no effect of using the measures in the first two years of care. And the real difference started to emerge after four years. Can you hasten that process? It doesn't seem like it. And the analogy I'd like to use is learning to speak a second language. Can you become proficient in ordering dinner and asking for directions in a second language pretty quick? Yes, but as anybody who's tried to get around in a different country with a, a, a phrase book knows, those phrases don't mean you're speaking the language. They mean you're speaking phrases. So initially when we're teaching students and when people uh, who are experienced there perceive even using the measures, I think of it like that. They're often developing phrases, but to become fluid with the language and then last to understand the nuance uh, in the language, to be able to express things in using different words but have the same meaning, that's a skill that takes some time. So my advice would be first for the, uh, for the university professor, start early. The data say, and this is work by Anderson and uh, Ogles, that the best predictor of a, of a student's outcomes at the end of graduate training is their scores at the beginning of their training in terms of interpersonal skills. Think about that. We don't seem to impact that much clinicians' ability to engage their clients. We fill their heads full of information. So I would say start early with outcome measurement. We're going to find out very quickly that some students are much better before they start school. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't uh, already know or haven't already seen. By measuring their performance, getting them in front of clients early, earlier, rather than having them spend their time for two years reading a book, my sense is that we would develop more individualized education fitted to that particular person's deficits, what they actually need to learn in clinical practice. Now, of course, the Bratlan study is about agency implementation, not individual implementation. So what can you do to improve your facility with FIT? Well, you can just start using it, practice and get consultation. There are 90 or more certified trainers on the ICCE that would love to provide a couple of hours of consultation to you as you try to implement FIT. I don't think it has to take four years, but I do think it's gonna take 
six months to a year to become proficient enough with this new language that you're actually seeing a difference in your outcomes as a result. Attend one of the trainings. Uh, have a discussion with people on the ICCE. If you're not a member of the International Center for Clinical Excellence, it's, it's absolutely free. And I know Cynthia will join me in saying it's really underutilized. Uh, there are people on there uh, every day asking questions and having discussions, but I think you really could get some help if you use that format. It's sort of like Facebook and YouTube for therapists. So, Tori, I, I hope I've answered your questions. Uh, Cynthia, did you have anything to add? Um, yeah, um, yeah, I agree that the the ICC is um, uh, very much underutilized, and it's a great resource. And usually, if somebody posts a question, you know, they they'll get a response within a day, uh, if not sooner. So, it is a, a really wonderful resource. Uh, for people to use. Hmm. Um, just a couple other things here, Scott. Okay. okay. Um, there's some, uh, someone, Susie was asking, uh, will they get, uh, will we be sending out the PowerPoint? Um, so. Thought. We won't be sending out the PowerPoint, but it will be embedded in the recording of the webinar, which I hope to make available sometime next week. Okay, great. Um, Elizabeth had a comment just about what you were talking about and um, that I think it's a common, I think it's, it has a common and uh, exclamation and a question mark. <laughs> that is foster cl uh, fit climate rather than just start using the ORS or SRS. So yeah, um, I think so it's about Elizabeth, fostering the climate, uh, fit climate. I, I think that's absolutely true. And uh, as, since Elizabeth is a, uh, a long time user and trainer, uh, she knows how important that uh, fit culture really is. So the, we spend a fair bit of time talking about how to create that culture, what to say to the client uh, in the beginning of the visit, when you go at the end of the visit to administer the, the measures. I would also say, and I know you'll agree with me, Cynthia, and I think Elizabeth will also agree that when people first start using the scales, 70 to 80 percent of the difficulties that they uh, email me about or you about have to do with failing to create that culture of feedback. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. so that means spending time saying, you know, I work a little differently than you may be accustomed to. Um, really dependent on your feedback to know that this is helping you and going in the right direction. I'll be observing, of course, but that never takes away from your input. So I really want to know is this helping you or not? And I particularly want to know when it's not a good fit because then I can change and adjust. We can add services and we can get you other places to have your needs more fully met. Yeah. Um, there's a question here from Miguel. Um, hi, Miguel. Um, Miguel was with us in for a brief time in March um, before That's right. uh, everybody had to fly home. <laughs> and Miguel had a long flight. <laughs> he did. So thanks, oh Miguel, for being thanks. there, gosh. Oh my gosh. Anyway, um, Miguel's asking how, as a, as a supervisor, we would do deliberate practice. Is it the same process? And how do you get a baseline as a supervisor if the impact is less than 1% of outcomes? Well, you correctly remember the study I cited from the prior webinar. And again, if you want to listen to that, if you're on this call, it'll be available tomorrow uh, on our YouTube channel. And I'm sending out an email that Tony Roos-Meniere's study from 2015 looked at hundreds of therapists that were supervised by scores of supervisors. And that when they looked at the impact of supervisors had on the outcome of therapists, it was uh, near, near zero really. So the whole idea of fit supervision, which means that the supervisee is talking to you about their red cases. And I, when I refer to a red case, I mean one of the cases that you've administered the measures to and one of the software system is saying that they are not on track. So most of supervision that's done, and I think one of the primary reasons why the data show that it really doesn't have much impact on client outcomes is because the therapist chooses the case to discuss. And what are therapists about? I will say you people, you therapists are relationship animals. You 
you just cling and you work that relationship. And so sometimes when a relationship is difficult, it doesn't necessarily mean the client isn't making progress. That's just the nature of relationships at time. But because of that confusion, we may be discussing interpersonal difficulties rather than outcome difficulties. The difference with fit supervision is we're starting with the outcome first. We know whether or not the client is experiencing progress because you have assessed and measured. And so hopefully we beat that 1%. And we have some evidence of that. A second study by uh, Simon Goldberg, and I'm proud to say I'm involved in this particular study, showed that when supervision was done, this was a study from 2016, when supervision was done, uh, using red hand cases and clinicians deliberately practiced at their performance edge. The outcomes did not go down as is typical for therapists the longer they're in practice, but rather they reversed and slowly began to go up in line with the amount of progress that you see from elite athletes. Now let me stop there and take a breath because I think this is an important point. We're not talking about deliberate practice revolutionizing your caseload unless you're really a poor therapist and the truth is most of us are going to be average because average outcomes in psychotherapy are really quite good. So I'll often say at workshops on deliberate practice, you've already made the Olympics. You're already at the Olympics. The question is how to get better from where you're at now. And it's going to take more time and effort to improve from where you are then than it took to get to where you are now. So that means look for very small incremental change over time. And that's exactly what uh, Goldberg found in the 2006 study. So my guess is that if you are a supervisor and you're using the outcome tools and the, the therapist you're working with is discussing red cases, that you're very likely to see uh, outcome improvements over time. Thanks, Miguel. Are we ready to move on, Cynthia? Yeah, we are. Oh, Good. Hang on. Uh, Ashley, uh, two questions came in right oh, just as I was saying that. Okay. So <laughs> Glenn uh, is asking, hello, I'm curious in how to talk about stagnation on the ORS with a client in psychotherapy when the client seems to be happy with treatment but still shows no improvement in outcome after several weeks. Okay. Also, for and how let many... Let me ask, is that Glenn yeah. Christofferson? Yep. Great. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, uh, for how many weeks can there be stagnation on the ORS before addressing it with the client? Thanks. Um, okay. These are both great questions, Glenn, and you were actually next on my list with the first question that you ask. So let's just talk about the ORS and some general ideas. And I have to be very careful when we talk, uh, when, when I give you the information I'm about to give, because people have in the past taken these as hard and fast rules. And really what FIT is about is to give us warnings or opportunities when we should take the time to have a conversation with a client. So depending generally on the, uh, on the client's score, most of the change in therapy across clients, if it's going to happen, tends to happen sooner rather than later. We can go all the way back to 1986 and to a study by my, one of my heroes in the field, uh, Ken Howard. We can go forward to Scott Baldwin's replication of this in an article called Untangling the Alliance Research uh, or Alliance Effects in Research. Uh, and both of those studies sort of supported this idea that if you paired up with this client at this time are going to make a difference, then most of that change happens sooner rather than later. How soon? you should start to see change within the first handful of visits. So that's five visits. That means that if the client score is where it usually is on intake in an outpatient setting, right around 19 or so or lower, then you should see an upward movement from visit to visit. If there is no upward movement on the ORS, then I'm asking as early as the second visit, I'm asking, did I miss something here? Secondly, I'm asking, what was it we were actually aiming at? Third thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna look back at the SRS and see, did I get some feedback 
in this session rating scale about the goals and tasks, about the means and methods, about the client's feeling of, uh, of my understanding their situation. How long should I wait to do that? The longer I've done this, and this sort of goes back to the, I think, language analogy, the longer I've done this, the more I feel willing to step in very early in the process. And a good reminder to do this is to look at the, the service delivery agreement and the FIT progress note in manual number six in the FIT treatment and training manuals, which by the way, are on sale right now, I think for 50% off. So you get them, they're, they're super cheap, e-download, e you'll have them instantly. And in, again, manual six, the FIT progress note reminds you each and every session is the client score going up, staying the same, or trending downward? And then the next question is, what are you doing about that? So if there's progress, what did you do? If there isn't any progress, or if the client scores have stayed the same, what did you do? And now let me state something more specifically to answer your question, Glenn. The longer clients do not experience a change, we're not talking about deterioration here, but no change, or what you might call stagnation, the greater the likelihood that they will be willing to accept a good relationship in place of a good outcome. So what's really important in that initial session is that you tell them what the consequences are when no change happens. So here's what I say. I really want to know if things are working. If, if we don't see some movement within the first three or four visits, then I'm, we're going to talk about this together and see what what am I missing and what could we do differently? If we talk and we try some new things and that still doesn't work, six, seven, eight visits, then perhaps it's time for us to begin exploring what else can we add to the care that we're doing. Sometimes that means inviting a family member in. It could be uh, attending a group or reading a book, a host of things. The point is we're not going to stand still. We're going to talk about it and see does something need to be added. And then if we're out 10, 11, 12 visits and there's still no change, then it could be possible that I'm just not the right person. That doesn't mean anything about your ability to change. It just means my ability or skill in bringing that about. And so I really depend on you to let me know how you're doing. So I hope that gets at the question a bit. I'm attending to this constantly. Uh, I am not going to allow a, a session to go by without talking about the lack of improvement. And secondly, I'm gonna be mindful that the longer we go without movement, the greater the likelihood that the client will accept having a good relationship. After all, what's not to like about you? You're kind, you're empathic, you're attentive to the individual client, and, but it's not enough. Uh, so I, I'm going to also have this requirement that we, we, there has to be some difference. There has to be some change. Again, one of those keys is making sure you talk about that in the beginning. How are we doing, Cynthia? Good. More questions rolling in. Um, uh, Bogdan is with us from Romania. Um, I'm interested in how do you balance in a group fit supervision setting the need to focus on the cases the therapist brings in um, that they need some support with uh, and the individual growth edge of each partic participant with the need to have a group dynamic and not let others feel they waste some of their time. Mm. Mm. So I think at least from the fit supervision model perspective, and please, Cynthia, jump in because you're the expert here. Uh, I'm not going to blend deliberate practice into the uh, fit supervision, uh, mostly because that approach is so uh, uh, standardized. The case is coming in. We're making sure that they are off track. We're using the stool to process the case. And the whole goal of fit supervision model is that the therapist thinks they have an idea about how to move forward. So, uh, and what we've found quite often is that the more efficient you get at doing the model as the supervisor, that other people in the group supervision will say, 
that their case suddenly began to resolve as they watched the process unfold. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that, Scott, because um, <laughs> I was thinking exactly that. Um, in fact, when um, I've been doing supervision, what I've done is I've had two separate meetings, one a clinical meeting focused on cases of concern and the other on the individual growth stuff. So. Yeah. And, and I think that really needs to be done individually. There's, there may be some kind of group thing. I, I haven't experimented with this yet. We're in the very early days, the wild west of deliberate practice, where we could use the group for perhaps support because deliberate practice can be a very lonely and uh, discouraging um, way to go, uh, especially in the beginning, because since it's focused on your growth edge, you're constantly failing. <laughs> constantly. Uh, and so perhaps it can be helpful to have other people around to, to give you uh, 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 support during the process. Go ahead, Cynthia. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you're right. And um, there's also, uh, I guess, um, as Bob is, is mentioning, you don't want to have others wasting, feeling like they're wasting their time while you're focusing on the the growth needs of it, of an individual participant so yeah. separating them out i always would have a group supervision session where we'd focus on cases and then each week i would also meet with uh, therapists for an individual th um, um, supervision and on on that respect let me let's just mention one other thing that we've begun talking about in uh, all of the trainings the intensive trainings whether in europe or in chicago and that's helping people stay out of the performance zone and instead stay in the learning zone. So when your colleagues feel like they have to show what they know or what they can do, then they're in the performance zone. And we would classify that learning environment or supervision environment as unsafe. They can't be in the learning zone because it shows how much they don't know. And one of the things we've been doing at the workshops Re recently is defining these two things, the performing zone, I got to show what I know, the learning zone, I don't know, I don't know what I'm, help me uh, figure this out. And we've been asking participants to raise their hand when we, the trainers, tip them into the performance zone. Because we're trying to push them constantly. And the more they're pushed, the more that their shortcomings become visible, the more tempting it is to back up and show, and show what you know, rather than to, to be in the learning zone. Cynthia? Yeah, interesting that two questions just came in that were quite related. I'm sort of moving on here. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, for, one from Jim and one from Mitchell. Um, um, uh, Jim is asking, what helps uh, you most as supervisors in understanding clinicians' uh, strengths, weaknesses that are useful in crafting deliberate practice strategies? For example, video, audio tapes, in addition to the ORS and SRS data. And uh, Mitchell is, um, oh, you're welcome, Mitchell, saying thanks so much for putting this together today uh -huh. um, and comments that Fitz really helped the practice, but was hoping to know any tips you may have about analyzing videos and recordings of sessions to determine uh, the growth edge. It's a great question, Jim. And let me just say that in the beginning, video is a very dense medium. And oftentimes when I'm speaking, People will come up and they'll say, so, so should I video my sessions? And I always say, no. Uh, and then they're kind of shocked because of, well, I've done the entire workshop to show videos of me making mistakes and then working to correct them and, and trying to move on from there. And, and they, they, they're trying to put the two things together. Here's, here's why I say, don't start with the video looking for things to improve. Uh, it's because if you start with your video, you will find so much to loathe about yourself. And it's it, because it's so dense, you'll be quickly overwhelmed. So instead, measure your results, parse the data, map it onto the TDPA, and then look for the area in the video relevant to your specific learning objective. And those things typically can be snippets of a minute to a minute and a half much more than that, and you lose focus, and again, you get tipped into the performance zone. So I, and I didn't think you, Jim, were suggesting just to start with the video, but I just wanted to lay it out for everybody, the process that we go to. You may find, for example, as we often do, that uh, 
therapists as they begin to parse their data, they discover as they're looking at their dropout rates that they have a fairly high number, perhaps beyond national norms for dropouts after the first visit. And as they map their performance onto the TDPA, we discover it falls in the structure and model area. Something about the way the session began or the way the session ended. Once we look for that, then I can focus on getting the person to bring to me the first three opening minutes of the session from perhaps four or five videos a week, being to look at those uh, as a supervisor supervising that, that particular person. I hope that helps, Jim. Thanks very much for the question. And thanks, Mitchell, for the thanks uh, as well. <laughs> Okay, um, Wendy is kind of going back on what you were just talking about a little minute ago okay. um, and, and asking what if a client so values the relationship that they tell the therapist the outcomes are improving just to stay in therapy with you? Yeah, you know, this whole idea of faking good uh, on the measures, I suppose, is a possibility. We haven't seen any evidence of that, that is research evidence that clients uh, fake good scores to stay to stay with you. But let's suppose that's what you suspect. When clients are improving, there should be a kind of natural progression of things that happens. What would those things be? The client starts to voice that they may need you less and less. So as the scores go up, and as long as the scores follow the trajectories in the computer program uh, so that they don't look like there's too much change or too little change, it's that Goldilocks uh, experience, just the right amount of change, then I'm also going to ask about that. I'm, I'm going to look at the scores and say, tell me what's happened. And if there are incongruities, I'm going to ask about that, not in a kind of gotcha, and you would never do that anyway, but I'm, I'm gonna say, well, now wait a second. You just were saying things were better, but I noticed that you're quite tearful. Can you help me understand and put those two things together? I've occasionally had clients say to me, they've never said, well, I lied. I was just faking so I could stay in therapy. But I have had clients say that, you know, maybe there is more to this than I thought. Or uh, I do feel better, but some of these things are still left unresolved. It could be a whole host of things. So. I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask about that. If I'm thinking that perhaps these scores are too good to be true, I might invite a, a collateral score. For example, I could ask, things look very good for you from your perspective. Yes, it's great. I love coming here. I love this relationship. And I might say, who might disagree with these scores in, your, in the world around you? Who might be the first person to say, ah, it's not that great? And what would they say we're not attending to in the session? So I'm not just blindly following the scores. The scores just give me an opportunity to, to have a conversation. So don't forget your clinical skills here when you begin to use the measures. Trust but verify uh, and, and ask those kinds of questions. Thanks for that question, Wendy. Um, Scott, um, Melvin uh, uh, sent a question um, to you ahead of time and he has just asked if, if you would be getting to that question or if, if he Is this the question it. about the graduate student? Yes. The, Mel Marsh? Yes. Okay. Um, so before we move on to the other questions, I just was hoping maybe we could address that so that... Um, Let's do that. I've got that right here and I love somebody who speaks up and says, hey, where's my, where's, where's my question? <laughs> so both Mel and Steve Sultanoff asked pretty much the same, the, the same, the same question, which is uh, said, uh, I'm a graduate student. I'm really not seeing much in the way of patients, clients, whatever at the moment. I'm learning as much as I can about fit. So when I'm on my own, I can use it. How should I best prepare in the meantime? Should I just continue learning about it and plan for what I should do later? Should I be trying the model? Should I just be, uh, become at ease with the scale and question? I'm not sure what I should do. So, Here's what you should do because you are uh, never in the same position you are uh, in your life after leaving graduate school. And for me, it was a time when uh, mostly someone else was responsible for my outcomes. It was a time I could experiment. Uh, so now's the time to do that. And let me just tell you a couple of things that I think you should do. First off, 
probably need to be exploring different ideas and different theories because feedback informed treatment is not a way of doing therapy. It's a meta theoretical approach, meaning that it's supposed to inform whatever approach you're using. One of the key structural or one of the key factors of effective psychotherapy is the therapist has a narrative, uh, a way that they think about the healing process that they can communicate effectively with clients. So the first thing I would say is explore, find an approach that appeals to you. It doesn't mean you'll stay there, uh, but it's a really solid way to start. Once you find that approach, I would, as much as possible, order as many videos as I can of people supposedly doing that approach. And then I'd use the stop-start technique. That is, once I've understood the approach and I think I've got the strategy in my mind, then I'm gonna roll the video of this particular expert doing that approach, and I'm gonna stop between exchanges. And I'm trying to guess, where is the expert going? I'm going to state out what I would say. Then I'm going to roll the video forward a minute and see, was I right or wrong? And which approach do I think is actually better? Was it what I said? Was it what this expert in that particular approach said? I'm still doing stop and start as a clinician. Uh, I stop the video now as a person who's been in practice for more than 30 years, watching the videos, I'm stopping them. And then I'm asking myself, what could I have said differently than what I know follows? I roll the tape forward and I do this over and over throughout 10, 15, 20 minutes of uh, the session. So were I in your position, I'd be attending as many trainings as I could. I'd read and see if there's an approach that appeals to me. I'd then order some videos and watch those videos and do stop and start. One other thing that uh, I, that I did, and I'm sure there are many people who have advice about this uh, that are on the line with us, uh, I asked a clinician if I could sit in on their sessions. And uh, the person that I asked was a gentleman named, by the name of Lynn Johnson, a psychologist in the area that I went to school in. He happened to have a one-way mirror. That's not a requirement. And he invited me to sit behind and watch him work as much as I wanted to. And it just so happened he was doing some work that, that uh, I was most interested in. Last but not least, build core counseling skills. That's, that's really the essence of this. I personally don't believe that there is such thing as advanced psychotherapy techniques. Uh, I think there's only the fundamentals, uh, empathy, respect, collaboration, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, the, the things that fill out those six factors that we talked about at the beginning of the, uh, of the broadcast. I hope that gets it, Mel and Steve. Thanks for the question. How are we doing, Cynthia? I'm good. A couple more questions here. Um, uh, one from Arna, um, who works in mental health with children, uh, with children, adolescents, and families, um, and says that there's a, quite a number of her clients have anxiety and ex and um, uh, exposure is a common approach that Arna takes with them. Um, and says, I have noticed a pattern in the FIT scores and conversations with this particular cohort where the SRS scores tend to deteriorate in the first few exposure sessions. In particular, the approach method is uh, rated poorly, which is completely understandable given how uncomfortable exposure can be. Inevitably, inevitably, sorry, after we see improvement on, afterwards we see improvement on the ORS the SRS then also starts to improve. Do you know of any research using FIT with this particular group um, or, or uh, is that just their uh, own experience and would love ideas about how to manage this type of scenario? Mm. It's, a really, it's a really great question and it's related to another question by Andrea, uh, Andreas and Gray and Jane. So let me just talk specifically uh, about exposure. First off, FIT is, sits independent of whatever approach you're using. Its idea is, did it help? And is the client engaged in the process? One thing we know about exposure is that it has a, a slightly higher dropout rate. 
uh, than other therapies. It's, it's, a, it's a problem with exposure-based treatment approaches. So if you're keeping your clients in through the process, well then bravo, it says something about the strength of your alliance. In general, however, we do know something about declining SRS scores. Each time the SRS score goes down, and it, can only, it only needs to go down by a single point, the risk of dropout increases. And as I said, this is a, a finding in the exposure-related research in, in, in general. And as a result, when clients drop out early in exposure treatment, not only are their alliances tend to be poor, but their outcomes uh, as well. Whatever you make of that, what I think is critical is using the SRS scores as a limiter, as feedback about whether or not we're doing too much and working too fast. So if we're experiencing deterioration, I have to be aware that the risk is the client may not return. And I might calibrate the work that I'm doing so as to keep those SRS scores uh, uh, moving the opposite direction from low to high rather than from uh, higher to lower. And this question is uh, related to Andres, uh, Andreas's and Gray and Jane's question. So this was a question about um, how to combine fit with other approaches. For example, EMDR. And the question was EMDR, particularly when you do the BLS procedure and it follows a fairly strict protocol. So let me be a little bit glib here and I hope I don't offend anybody, uh, but take it in the spirit that it's given. Uh, the, whenever people start to do fit, the usual question is, can I incorporate fit into what we do? And I say, that's not what fit is about. Fit is about getting you to question what you do. So you have to decide from the outset that the outcomes and the alliance scores mattered more than the approach. And this generally takes some reworking in people's minds. So let me give you one example. And I actually wrote a blog post about this uh, not too long ago uh, about the question of whether or not they should fit uh, fit into what they do. They, they, what they wanted to know was could they could they fit uh, could they a, adopt fit when they did single session therapy? And I said, is there any chance that you might change your mind about what you're giving clients? No, they said. We do single session therapy. That's what we're known for. Then I said, please don't use my measures. And they were a little bit baffled by that, actually. Why shouldn't we use your measures? It would help us. And I said, don't use my measures because the measures are supposed to disrupt what you do. So you can use any protocol, any particular treatment, but if you're unwilling to change what you're doing in response to client feedback or moderate it in some way, then why use the measures at all? So it's not about fit fitting into what you do, it's about fit making you question uh, what, what you do. Uh, Cynthia, how are we doing? Uh, good, just a couple more questions. Um, okay. Lots of questions, that's great. Yeah. Um, Emma's asking, do you ever experience a mismatch between the person's ORS and SRS scores? Uh, high SRS, but a low ORS, and I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> you go that, ahead. <laughs> well, well, and that, that particular pattern is a common one, isn't it, Cynthia? Yes, it is. <laughs> and, and in fact, as, as low or, as if SR, ORS scores rather, get the, num the, the acronym straight here. If the outcome radius scale scores are dropping, there is a strong tendency for the SRS scores to go up or to stay high over time, 39, 40s even. We call that a Mary Poppins profile. Uh, think about it. The client's saying that their life is very bad, but you're practically perfect in every way. It's going to be harder to get feedback from a client who has become dependent on you. They're not gonna complain about the color of the life raft that's been thrown in their direction. So with these particular clients, uh, you're going to have to work extra hard to get feedback. But secondly, you can simply take the ORS as the feedback that you need. If the outcomes don't improve, we need to talk about it. Let's talk about the reverse pattern. You have ORS scores going up and SRS scores trending down. That's also a problematic uh, uh, pattern. It's literally a crisscross pattern. ORS up, SRS down. We're crisscross, meaning that this client is getting better, but they like you less and less. 
And what we know from this is that a drop of a single point on the SRS correlates with declines on the ORS two to three weeks later. Let me say that again. A drop of a single point on the SRS is correlated with declines on the ORS two to three weeks later. We have no idea what that is about. It may be a spurious correlation, but it's so consistent that we recommend that when you see a drop of a single point and the client has been making some progress, that you stop and you ask, number one, can you talk about this, this uh, d decrease in the SRS? What was different this time? Very often clients will say, I don't know, it seemed the same to me. It was only one point, you know, how big could it be? And I'll say, well, here's what we've noticed. Research shows us that at times when this SRS begins to go down, even though we may not know what it is about, and we may think it's about nothing, that sometimes a week, two weeks, three weeks later, the ORS begins to decline as well. So let's take a look into the future. Can you see anything that might disrupt the positive path you're on at the moment? And I'm gonna have that conversation. If they say no, that's okay. Only one of two things can happen. The scores in the future on the ORS go down, in which case I've been a profit and it intensifies the relationship I have with the client. Or the scores do not go down as predicted, in which case the client comes back and shows me up that I don't, that I don't know everything. I say, well, you know, you are the exception. You kept it going in the right direction. You know, Cynthia, I have a, a list of, of additional questions here that I didn't get to and I, I feel bad about. I'm really grateful that people were active in uh, asking the questions today. Uh, my guess is I think we need to do another one of these. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what else do we have to do these days? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And actually, it's been kind of fun preparing and having people uh, ask the questions. So, Cynthia... <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to commit to a, uh, a third uh, version of this. Maybe we do it, offer it in a week or 10 days. Uh, we'll send it out to everybody who signed up for this one. If you've sent us a question that I haven't gotten to, I promise uh, we'll work hard to get to that particular question the next time around. If you have additional questions and you want to ask them, send them to either Cynthia or I, and we'll put them in, uh, in, the, in line here to be answered the next time we're all together. Then for now, I'm going to say goodbye to all of our fit friends uh, around the world. Uh, we wish you health and safety during these difficult times. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone.